And we're back again, just uh, headed to the fridge during our break between uh, videos to get myself a nice cold Ching Dao. So cheers everyone, bottoms up. Any Lambda brothers out there, follow the 12. Anyway, here we are back at the court of the later Zhao dynasty. The, the, the gentle, studious, good prince Shi Hong has been usurped by the bad prince, the psychopathic evil uh, Shi Hu, who uh, has staged a palace coup, and Shi Hong is helpless. In fear, he offers the throne of uh, all under heaven, the throne of the later Zhao dynasty, to Shi Hu. Shi Hu, acting after the example of his hero, Cao Cao, sarcastically declined and said something along the lines of, No, no, you're the crown prince after all, go ahead and take it, but I, quote unquote, strongly suggest that you make me the prime minister and the king of Wei, and give me the nine bestowments while you're at it. Note that these are the same titles that Cao Cao took. Poor Shi Hong must have looked to his history books and seen what was coming. Now again, if I had been Shi Hong, I would have said something awesome like, Golly gosh, Shi Hu, who was my dad again? Oh yeah, he was the emperor, and he's dead. So, wait a minute, that makes me the emperor, and you're not the emperor, off with your head. As you can tell, I spent a lot of time fantasizing about this. Perhaps you would say he knew he would have been killed if he had said that. But surely there must have been some faction loyal to him. He could have even drawn his sword and made a heroic last stand with his bros. But he didn't, and instead he allowed the situation to get worse. Anyway, Shi Hong, for whatever reason, didn't decide to do the heroic thing, nor did he take a lesson from the story of Cao Cao. Instead, he asked his mom, the Empress Dowager, for help. This was the same lady who had saved Shi Hu when he was in danger. She tried to enlist another prince to attack Shi Hu, but the plan failed. Shi Hu, again emulating his old hero Cao Cao, had her killed. Imagine the nerve of this guy, though. I mean, Shi Hu was, by rights, the Empress Dowager's subject, and he had her executed as if she was a common criminal. I can only imagine the language he must have used to have her executed, for he could not have done so without the Emperor's ostensible permission. It must have been something like, Oh, your majesty, this woman has threatened the security of your royal person and must be punished. I ask you to order her death. Something like that. Imagine doing that with a straight face. What a bastard. And he did this to the, his very aunt, who had previously saved his life, remember from the video before. What a savage twist of irony. So let's look at poor Shi Hong. Excuse me. That was the last emperor or the, well, not the last emperor, that was the emperor, remember. So these names all sound alike, at least to me, because I don't speak Chinese. And again, sorry, so, so Shi Hong is the emperor, Shi Hu is the usurper. Understandably dismayed at being forced to approve his mom's death, he couldn't understand it anymore, or he couldn't stand it anymore. Talk about a golden cage, this guy was supposedly the son of heaven and the ruler of all beneath it, but he was basically the captive of Shi Hu and had to go along with it. So, what did he do? He decided to make one last plea for humane treatment. He must have known that it wouldn't work since his cousin was a first-rate psychopath that made the Joker look like Gandhi. But at any rate, Shi Hong made his way one night to Shi Hu's house carrying the Emperor's Jade Seal and said something along the lines of, like, oh, I don't know, the mandate of heaven has passed to you for the preservation of the dynasty. Please take the throne and rule all under heaven. That's right. Shi Hong offered the throne to Shi Hu again. Imagine having to do that to the man who had your mom killed. What agony poor Shi Hong must have gone through. But Shi Hu, in true psychopath fashion, said something dripping with sarcasm like, Oh, I'm only your lowly servant. I would not dare take the throne from your highness. Poor Shi Hong had to return to the palace to await his fate. 
Of course, everyone, Sher Hong included, knew that Sher Hu wanted to be the emperor, and this was as good a time as any, but of course he had nothing better to do than insult and torment Sher Hong first. Now, by now, Sher Hong had been ruling, in theory, for about a year. Not long afterward, Sher Hu made an announcement. He said that Sher Hong had violated the morning customs regarding his father, which he hadn't. As a result, Sher Hong was, quote unquote, strongly advised to abdicate the throne. Poor Sher Hong by now seems to have been completely despairing of his fate. He made no attempt to resist. In fact, he probably thought by resisting, or by not resisting, he would escape with his life, which he didn't. Not long after being deposed, Sher Hong was executed, which by rights should have happened to Sher Hu if only Sher Hong had had the courage to try. Poor Sher Hong never got the justice that he deserved in his life, but we can hope that he found rest in the hereafter. But, as the ever quotable Gandalf the Grey said, many that die deserve life, and some that live deserve death. Sher Hu's first act as emperor was to change the era name following an ancient Chinese custom wherein not only emperors have names, but their reigns too. The um, great historian John Kie in China A History, I'm not sure if Kie is the right pronunciation, but he wrote China A History, really good book. He talked about this, this reign name or this era name sort of uh, tradition. Uh, and, and he likened it to uh, us knowing Chairman Mao as Chairman Great Leap Forward. So think about it like that. Anyway, so the emperors not only have their names, but, the, but there's also their reign having a name. And he named, Sher Hu reign, named his reign period Jian Wu, which appropriately enough means establish militarism. He even lived in a palace called Tai Wu, which means like excessively militaristic or like too militaristic. In the two decades that followed, I, I mean, it, w it was an orgy of bloodshed. It, it, horrible, absolutely horrible. Orgy of bloodshed and chaos to the poor people of northern China. His atrocities I've already described, and the common people of China were forced into slave labor to build extravagant palaces where, where Sher Hu decided to have a, a decades-long party. He ate, drank, and made merry with concubines until he died in 349. As a side note, as if killing your cousin weren't bad enough already, he also murdered his own son, daughter-in-law, and grandchildren. While doing this, he even claimed to be a Buddhist. I suppose much in the same way that the Spanish Inquisition was Catholic. Maybe he thought he was helping his victims by speeding them on to their next incarnations. I don't know. Mo more likely, though, he saw Buddhist missionaries from an inner Asian perspective, like as an inner Asian nomad. That's how he saw them. He saw them as shamans with weird powers, and therefore to be respected and feared. Of course, the inevitable fate of tyranny is downfall, and though Sher Hu seems to have died a natural death, his empire was not to last. Three emperors were enthroned and deposed in two years, and the realm descended into even worse chaos than before. I'm sorry to say that this tragic story ends with nothing short of an ancient genocide. As we've discussed, Shu Hu and company were not actually Chinese, ethno-linguistically speaking. They ruled and terrorized a, a Chinese population and took on the trappings of Chinese emperors, but were themselves... Um, belonging to an ethnic group known as Jie, and apparently the Jie language was completely different from anything, or completely different from Chinese and even from other Xiongnu languages. The Jie people even had a different appearance from their neighbors. It's a sad reality that very often an entire ethnic group suffers for the terrible actions of a few of its members. The Jie were one of these ethnic groups. Following the, following the overthrow of the later Zhao dynasty, the Jie people were completely hunted down and killed. This included every one of the ethnic group, even those who had nothing to do with the dynasty's reign of terror. Women, children, you know, whatever. Escape or blending into the Chinese population was impossible since the Jie seemed to have had such distinct features. It was horrible. Even, even though Sher Le and Sher Hu were bad guys, and 
I mean, I'm sure there were lots of nice J people too, and like like Sher Hong, they had to suffer despite having done nothing wrong. Racism is bad. <laughs> Racism is bad. Really, that's all we can say about it. And so, anyway, as a matter of fact, along with the J, uh, the uh, many other Xiongnu were killed, and the survivors were driven from China. Could this have been the beginning of the migration of nomads that would end a hundred years later at the gates of Rome? Maybe. The Xiong in Xiongnu sounds kind of like Hun, after all, don't you think? This genocide, at any rate, was so thorough, thorough and complete that as a result, we don't even know who the GA were. All that remains of their language is a single sentence transcribed by a passing monk. What was this sentence? Does it contain the key to unlocking the mystery of the GA people? Who they were, where they came from? Probably, because otherwise there would be no material for a video. At any rate, we'll talk about it next time. Bye, everybody.